So the state of the the economy is perilous. The state of the environment is far more so. Dr. James Hansen is here with us, member of the National Academy of Sciences, adjunct professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University and Columbia's Earth Institute, director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He's frequently called to testify before Congress on climate issues. His background in space and earth sciences is extraordinary. Uh, he's the guy who, one of one of the people, I would say, in my opinion, the person who first advised us of the dangers coming. He has a new book out, Storms of My Children, Storms of My uh, Grandchildren, excuse me, StormsofMyGrandchildren.com is the website for the book, the subtitle, The Truth about the coming climate catastrophe and our last chance to save humanity. And also, I should add, uh, uh, James Hansen has uh, been a great source of inspiration, and many of us have been writing about this for many years, myself and and uh, people like my friend Bill McKibben, who, who mentions you at every opportunity he gets, Dr. Hansen. Welcome to our program. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here with us. More importantly, thank you for being over all these years in the face of all the crap that has been thrown at you by these large transnational carbon-based corporations, the guy who, who just keeps standing there and telling the truth over and over and over again. I so honor you and the work that you're doing. Tell us, uh, Dr. James Hansen, your book, Storms of My Grandchildren, uh, early on in the book, you have a, a, a beautiful photograph of your granddaughter. Um, your 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 motives and the motives of many people in the in the um, climate change concern arena. I, I I don't know what you would call it. Have been often uh, questioned by the uh, corporate shills as oh they're just trying to get more money for their research projects or tenure at the university or blah de blah de blah. Um, Tell, tell us your thoughts on why you and so many of your colleagues are are so committed to this effort. Yeah, well, of course, that, that charge is, of course, complete nonsense. In fact, when I first came on the scene in a significant way, it was 1981, when I published a paper in Science uh, a Journal, which was reported on the front page of the New York Times by Walter Sullivan, the science writer, I promptly had my funding uh that was to be coming from Department of Energy uh, canceled because of that. They did not like the publicity uh, given to the global warming issue. Yeah, this, of course, so, during the Reagan administration, in fact. Yeah, yeah, but uh, in general, that has often been a problem, and that has caused scientists, I think, to be reticent, many scientists, to be reticent about speaking out because... Mm -hmm. You may temporarily uh, get some favor from some politicians, but on the long run, you're going to suffer. So that that was, of course, nonsense. Now, what I did in the 1980s was testify to Congress uh, several times, and after it got a lot of attention in 1988 because of the drought then, and in 1989 because I revealed that the administration had changed my testimony, I then decided to get out of that business of public uh, speaking because it's not not my fort and um, and I, I I get my pleasure from science the way that Richard Feynman did um, mm -hmm. called it the pleasure of finding things out yeah so for 15 years I I maintained this uh, vow not to accept television interviews and such thing and leave that to people who were really good at it and who enjoy it like Steve Schneider and Michael Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. But finally, I got to the point when I had grandchildren uh, where I realized that the public policy was just not addressing this at all, and the public didn't understand the matter, and I decided I was going to give one talk in which I really tried very hard to back it up with scientific papers and get publicity in Washington, D.C., and, and anyway, it turned out that one talk uh, didn't do it, and I kind of got dragged into it more and more over the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. Now, you originally had suggested that um, we, uh, first of all, to, to set some numbers, before the Industrial Revolution, the level of carbon dioxide in the air in parts per million was what? About 280 parts per million. Okay, and right now it is where? There's 387 uh, last year, 209. Okay. And it's going up 2 ppm per year. 
Right. And and originally you had suggested that 450 was a a number that we really needed to to stop at or or all hell was going to break loose. You have recently revised that back down to 350, thus uh, inspiring Bill McKibben to start his 350.org. Do I have that right? Yeah, in fact, he was going to start an organization called 450.org um, until he asked me to just reaffirm that that was the right number, mm-hmm. and I and I said, uh, unfortunately, we screwed up. Yeah, um, I had um, when I had the opportunity to speak to the Bush administration, the Vice President Cheney, and and six cabinet members, um, I had made the argument that 450 would probably keep additional global warming at about one degree Celsius, which would be about two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, actually 1.7 above the pre-industrial level. And some prior interglacial periods had been warmer than the present one, and I thought that that they um, suggested that somewhat warmer would be, uh, that much warmer might be okay. But mm-hmm. what has become clear in the last three or four years is that The Earth's history shows us that the system is more sensitive than we thought. And also, ongoing observations of the Arctic sea ice, and especially things like the ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet. And the glaciers around the world. They're already beginning to lose mass at a faster and faster rate. So it's clear we've moved into, and we've already seen the the climate zones shifting. That's why mm-hmm. Southwest United States is beginning to have more right. uh, dry periods, more forest fires. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then the storms are more severe. We're talking with Dr. James Hansen, his new book, Storms of My Grandchildren, The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Sir, I'm, 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 I'm very sorry. We have about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes left here. What are the most important things that our listeners can do? What, what what are the steps that have to be taken, and how can citizen activists facilitate those? Yeah, it, it, uh, let, let me mention the most important thing. Um, the problem is that fossil fuels are the cheapest form of energy. Um, and as long as that's true, they're going to be used more and more. The reason is that they're not made to pay for the damages that they do to human health and the environment and the future for our children and grandchildren. Um, we have to put a gradually rising price on carbon emissions. A carbon tax? Well, no, I would call it a non-tax because mm. you have to give back 100% of the fee that you collect. The fee should be collected at the mine or port of entry mm-hmm. from the fossil fuel company at the first sale. And the money then should be distributed to the public so that they have the wherewithal to make the changes in their lifestyle. The next time they purchase a vehicle, uh, they get a more efficient one. They right. insulate their homes. They do the things that are necessary to reduce their carbon footprint and right. keep their prices, because they are going to have to pay more. Yeah, for- A lot of this is what Denmark is doing, isn't it? Yeah, there, to some extent this is being done in Europe, but it's not across the board. Mm-hmm. It has to be at the mine or port of entry so that it covers um, carbon uh, completely. Right. And the only way that it's going to to work and the public accept it is if they get if they get the money rather than Congress deciding to hand it out to the special interests the way they, they do now. So the cap and trade scheme will not work. And this is the the difficult point. You know, I was on the David Letterman show and I and he asked me about it and I started to say, Well people are gonna have to understand the difference between right. cap and trade and fee and dividend. Yeah, no, I, 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 I get it. Uh, hey, Dr. Hansen, I'm, I'm very sorry we're, we're out of time. This is the Tom Hartman Program.